here we go. Go ahead. So good morning, Sabbath School. Uh, we are about to engage in lesson number 11. And as you know, throughout this period, we've been working on uh, interpreting the Bible, how to interpret the Bible. And today, lesson 11 is about Bible and prophecy. Now, you know, the Bible is a very unique book. According to Apostle Peter, the, the prophets were moved by the Holy Spirit to write the Bible. So whatever is in the Bible is like God messages to us. But often we misinterpret the Bible because we are not sure how to interpret it. So today we are going to go through uh, um, with my panel here. Well, after I introduce them, we're going to discuss how we should, in, should uh, interpret prophecy. And in particular, we're going to be focused on the 2300 uh, days or years uh, in Daniel uh, 8, 14. So all our thinking is going to be, how do you uh, match up with the way the Bible explains uh, to do prophecy? And how do we uh, know now to continue to follow in that pathway? Because there are so many different theories out there about how to interpret the Bible. So we ask you to listen carefully to each person as they present the, the different aspect of what they're doing. Uh, before we begin, however, let's, uh, let's, let me introduce the panel and then we'll have a word of prayer. Here on this panel today, we are fortunate to have um, we Pastor Ose, who is a pastor of West Wilmington Church. And we are also fortunate to have uh, Donald Hardy, who is at the White Marsh Church, but he was a former member with us at um, West Wilmington. Um, he's also, you know, very um, involved in, in doing a lot of ministry. And then we have Chris uh, uh, Garrity, who is our treasurer, and he's a teacher at the West Wilmington Church. Uh, he's also the, um, a ministry leader there. So he's also a pretty busy person, but uh, we are always happy to do Sabbath school. So my name is Kent Bourne McFarlane, and uh, I'm an elder there at the church. And so what I'll be doing, I'll be leading out a little bit as a moderator. And we've I've broken down the lesson into a number of little categories, and each person is going to talk about different categories. We, first of all, are going to talk about uh, historicism, historicism and prophecy. And then we talk about the year-day principle in, in prophecy. Then we're going to try, to try to identify the little horn in Daniel, and then we do the investigative judgment, and then we're going to talk somewhat about typology and prophecy. Now, as you know, there are uh, somewhat uh, uh, different um, ways to interpret prophecy, so we're going to try to make a little difference and show you why the historicist method, which we're going to talk about a lot today, is the best method. But before we go, let's bar head. Fasa, would you pray for us? Absolutely. Father God, we are so grateful, Lord, that you give us the opportunity to study your word. Uh, and in studying it, dear Father, we, we gain a better understanding of who you are. Uh, we pray, dear Father, that in doing so, that we would be able to glean uh, tools, dear Father, to help us to better understand and to be able to know the times that we're living in and share with others. So we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's first of all look at the memory verse that we have, the memory text that we have for today's study. It's found in Daniel 8, 14, and we can read it, I'll read it and then uh, we can discuss a little bit around it. Uh, and he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Now, you know, uh, as, as we talk about the Bible, we realize that, and some people may not realize it, but the Bible is about 30% of the Bible is all about prophecy. And there are different types of prophecy. Um, we have what we call classical uh, prophecy that, is, that we, we refer to different individuals in the Bible. But we also have the apocalyptic uh, 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 <laughs> prophecy, which talks about the end time. And we have the messianic prophecy. So essentially, you could break the, the prophecy down into these three categories. One of the problems we have, however, is that 
there are interpretation techniques in the Bible. As you know, you can't use the same mathematical formula to if you're studying medicine than if you're doing something else. So you really need to, uh, the Bible has its own way of also in, uh, interpreting the prophecy. And we're going to get into that when we talk about the day of uh, prophecy, a uh, uh, technique, principle. So essentially what we're going to be talking to today is there are three different methods out there that is being used to interpret Daniel prophecy. One is historicism, which is largely what we as Seventh-day Adventists believe in, and actually what the reformers believed in long before there was uh, the Seventh-day Adventist church. Uh, they, they realized that uh, following the historicist method, which is almost like saying we're tracing, we're laying out in history. We, we, it's, it's, it's a parallel line to history. So when we, the, the, the events are sequential, and we'll take a look at that uh, as we go through here, uh, we find that it's, it's, the, it's the way the Bible actually interprets it, uh, prophecy. As you read in the story of Daniel, when you look at the images, you, you see there are four kingdoms and they come one after the other. And those can be verified in history. You can go back in history and look at those three kingdoms, four kingdoms, they come one after the other. Uh, but there is also uh, the, the preterist method. And as I said, pre-preterist means people uh, with a school of thought out there that all the prophecies of Daniel were fulfilled a lot before Jesus was born, at least primarily before uh, AD 70. And then there's another method also called the futurism method, a futuristic method. And they believe that nothing is, everything is way in the future will be fulfilled later in the future. Uh, when you try to look at those two methods, what happened is that you have to think about breaking up the prophecy and having a gap of maybe about a thousand years or more, and more than one gap. So it it's doesn't follow the Bible trend. But the historicist method does because it follows the historical pattern and we can always go back and look at that. We're going to uh, unpack some of that as we discuss as we go along here. So Bible prophecy is crucial to our identity and mission, uh, especially for the Seventh-day Adventist Church because this is really where we focus a lot uh, on trying to bring the gospel to people and let them realize that you know the gospel is genuine. It comes from God, and we are not making it up. Uh, prophecy provides an internal and external mechanism to confirm the accuracy of God's word. Jesus said, and now I have told you before it comes that when it comes to pass, you may believe. That's in John 14, 29. So essentially, we're not using prophecy to forecast the future, but we're using prophecy to confirm what was said in the past and to, to be sure that, and, and to be assured that it is the word of God. This present and crucial question, how do we interpret prophecy correctly so that we know when the prophecy has indeed come to pass? So that's what we're going to be talking about. And I'll come back and say some more, but let me pass it on now to, uh, to, to Donald that will try to explain to us uh, how the, the, the history, Historicism, or the historic, <laughs> I'm, I'm having trouble talking today. Historist view. Historicist uh, uh, prophecy works, meaning that we are following, uh, we can follow the prophecy with history. That's essentially the best way to look at it, because they, 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 Daniel prophesied these things thousands, a couple of thousand years ago, but we know that what he said is true because we can go back and follow it in history. So Donald, why don't you go ahead and uh, and 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 uh, explain to us. Sure, I'll, I'll do my best with the spirit leading. Um, first, I'd like to go back and actually talk about if this was our first topic, and this was our first lesson in this quarter, and go back and just understand the actual meaning of how to interpret the Bible. I think that would be a big help for anybody, Adventist or non-Adventist, because we have different versions of the Bible, right? That right there is a problem. 
So interpreting the Bible, you could be interpreting the wrong Bible, the Catholic Bible or the Mormon, the Book of Mormons. Or, so the bottom line is, I think we need to understand, first of all, before we just start throwing out scripture and text, uh, we need to make sure that these things are, are, are applicable to our daily lives and we can use them in, in a practical way, because it's more than just about us. It's about others, really, because, you know, everything points to Christ. But when Christ was on the cross, we know that the cross represented two things. And I'm going to just lead out in a little bit different way. We're going to have some fun. So the cross was two different things. This one, Jesus was suspended between heaven and earth, right? That was him and his relationship between the Father. This here was the relationship between man, mankind, our neighbor, right? So when we learn that, when we learn how to interpret the Bible, we actually get to know Jesus. But once we get to know Jesus, I'm sorry, guys, forgive me. Uh, hopefully my screen's not going black. I got people calling me left and right. Once we get to know Jesus, we actually know we got to go for him. So when we interpret the Bible, we didn't really know what we're interpreting and why this is here for us and what's the purpose of prophecy. Why is he giving us prophecy? What does that even mean, right? So it's great to know timelines and dates and events. Back in the day when I was with Kent and I was in Sabbath school and I can't remember the room, it was down by primary, it was on the left, there was a piano in there. There was all kinds of things. I think it was a youth room. I was teaching Daniel Revelation all the time. The, uh, every single week, every single weekend, I was doing Bible studies. And I was so bent on making sure everyone knew Bible prophecy. You need to know last day events. You need to know this. You need to know that. I'm saying this for a reason. So we'll get to the, the, the study in a second. But I wanted to, to know that the, the, the prophecy is great. And it's redemptive. But we really need to know that prophecy is Christ. It's the Christ throughout the Bible. It's a thing. Everything points to Christ, right? The prophecy of Jesus coming and dying on the cross. And then the prophecy of Jesus coming in a second coming to take us all home, right? And that's really where the historic view comes in the point. And it all points forward, right? Prophecy points forward and it all comes true. Now we have some, some prophets that go back in the past and they, they talk about some things. You know, they, people go back and talk about Isaiah and Ezekiel and Amos. Um, but when we move forward, it's in an unbroken pattern. When we're talking about Daniel, we're talking about Revelation. Now we can go back a little bit and we'll use some of the scripture like Ezekiel and Isaiah and Jeremiah to help make some points when it comes to Daniel or Revelation, right? Because Paul went back and used the Old Testament all the time, even though he wasn't really a prophet. So with that, we had to interpret the Bible. I believe that it's very, very important that we make sure that it is the Holy Spirit that interprets the Bible for us and that the Bible interprets itself. And not just someone just reading the Bible for the sake of reading the Bible. There's a lot of Adventists and Christians that just come to church, punch the clock. They're pure warmers. They read the Bible. But is it really, really making a difference in their life? So... You come to church, you listen to Jose, correct? Make sure I pronounce your name right. You listen to Jose, you listen to, uh, um, uh, what's, what's the other guy's pastor when I was there? Um, uh, Elvis. Uh, Elvis. Elvis. Elvis and, and Master Merrill Cabinets before that. Um, when you hear them, if we're not studying, we're not spending time with the Lord every single day, evening, morning, at noon, like Daniel and David, our view of church, our view of the Bible, our, our interpretation is going to be very, very limited, very warped. We need to spend time with Lord long before church. You know, we need to spend time with Lord, walk with him throughout the day. So I just want to make that very clear. We need to spend time with God. When we get close to the God, we would be, we'd behold what we become. We're transformed. And our, our interpretations are much different because they're spirit-led. I think it's very important. Um, so with prophecy, I, I really want to understand, well, what is the point of prophecy? Other than just knowing the dates and the timelines, what is prophecy? What is it? What is it for? What's the purpose of prophecy? Now I'm going to get us all thinking. This just isn't, this isn't Donald Hardy talking. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a scholar. I'm just a young guy who loves Jesus and reads the Bible. So what is the purpose of prophecy? Kent talked about it a little bit. He just gave us a little bit. He touched on it. What is the purpose of prophecy? Well, one purpose I like uh, that John talks about in chapter 16, he talks about prophecy. Actually, when we look at fulfilled prophecy in the Bible, actually helps, encourages our faith in Jesus by 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 seeing in the Bible and seeing in history that prophecy actually has come true. Like you think about the image in Daniel chapter two, right? Where Daniel's writing about this prophetic image in Daniel two, about four kingdoms that haven't even set up powers yet. That's pretty amazing how Jesus knows the end from the beginning. And that for me as a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, that really builds and solidifies my faith specifically not just in Jesus, yeah. but then also Absolutely. all of the other prophecies that haven't been fulfilled yet. Right. Very good, very good. Um, you, might want to add also, uh, you might want to add also a text um, from 2 Peter 1, 19 to 21. 
And uh, that text says, uh, uh, so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in the dark place until the, dawn, the day dawn and the morning star rise in your hearts, knowing this first, but no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation, for prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good verse. That text kind of helps us to see that, you know, God is trying to tell us something uh, that is uh, that's going to come, that's going to be, be happening in our world, and he wants us to be prepared. But he's not trying, but we're not to use it, say, well, we are forecasting the future because the, the power of the prophecy is that when it comes to pass, you know that Daniel couldn't have prophesied 2,000 years down the road. It has to be divine. So the, the fulfillment of prophecy is really uh, help us to, as, as Chris said, to give us assurance and to comfort us in our faith to know that there is a God who is leading us and who is guiding us and who is showing us the way. And if we would follow that way, then we would be okay. Amen to that. Um, I want to read two verses. If someone can look up Amos 3, 7. And I know this is probably, this is probably in the, the, the lesson study. Um, let's read two, two more. So someone grab Amos 3, 7, and then someone could read both of uh, John 13, 19 and John 16, 1 to 4. And then we'll, we'll talk about those in a second. So we got Amos 3, 7. I'll take John 16, 1 to 4. Okay. And then, um, then someone else grab 13, 19, John 13, 19. I'm going to start with Amos 3, 7. Okay. So uh, who has uh, John 13, 19? Yeah, I guess I'll grab that one. <laughs> okay. Let's do that. Let's start with Amos 3, 7 when you're ready. It says, uh, surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. Okay. So let's, let's hold on to that for a second. Now we're going to go down and I'm going to go back to Amos and we're going to recap all three. John 13, 19. John 13, 19 uh, says here, I am telling you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am who I am. Very good. I like that verse. Yeah, I love that Okay. One. Mr. Kent. 16 what? Uh, I need 16, 1 to 4. One John to 16, four. 1 to 4. These things have I spoken unto you that ye should not be offended. Uh, they shall put you out. Am I reading around here, right thing? Uh, John 16, 1 to 4. Yeah, go ahead. I got yeah, you. Yeah, I'm, I think it's the right one. They shall put you out of the synagogues. Yea, the time cometh that whoever killeth you will think that they are doing God's service. Mm. And these things they will do unto you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I've, I told you that when the time shall come, ye may remember that I told you of them. And these things I said, not unto you at the beginning, because I was with you. Wow. So if you actually go back a little bit in the verse, these things were giving to us so that we might know, that we might know him. So a lot of things were given throughout the Old Testament. And when Jesus came, did they know him? They didn't. They didn't. If anything, what did they do? What did it just say? What did they do that they will do to us in the last days? Persecute them. Persecute in his name's sake. Yeah. So he gives us these things to know these things. So there's a couple of things here. And also I like, remember what uh, God did for Abraham? What did he do for Abraham? What was God to Abraham in just the sense of the human side of things? If we, as we think, if I said God and Abraham, what would you think? They were friends. There you go. It's the word I'm looking for. They were friends. What did God do to Abraham in the, for the sake of Lot? I'm just getting the wheels turning. We're having fun here. He told him his plans. God spoke to Abraham as a friend. God's revealing his secrets to us. He doesn't want us living in the dark. He doesn't want us guessing. Now, it's funny because you're going to say, well, Don, then why is it so hard to understand uh, prophecy? Why are things written in code? Why is that? Why, is, why are things written in code? Why in the world did John write with beasts and symbols and numbers? I, I and, think, and, and Daniel? Uh, 
I think uh, you could say that for us, it seems like in code, but for the, if you put it in the time when they were listening to those prophecies or when they were written, they were written in a way that it would be easier for them to understand. I mean, it was written in their language, so to speak, that back in those days. We speak a different language today in a, in a way, in terms of the, the symbolic nature of, of what was there. But the, sim the symbols, for example, when we go into the Daniel prophecy and see all those symbols, they're symbolic uh, because most people live in that culture where they would understand, you know, you know, they're shepherd people that understand, you know, the wolf and the, 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 uh, the, the different animal yeah. what they relate to. Yeah. They also understand the idea for the horn. They use the horn for nation. I mean, it looks like that's a big problem, but back then they would understand that all they see is animals, sheep and goats with big horns and the bigger one rule, you know? So in a sense, it's not as mysterious for the people when it was written, but it is more mysterious for us because, you know, we speak completely different languages today. It, it's foreign to them, just like heaven is foreign to us. I mean, for us, it's foreign. Heaven's foreign to us because we don't speak that language. God's preparing us here for a land where we cannot breathe and we cannot speak, right? We don't speak like angels. We don't, we don't have the fourth dimension. We don't understand the, heaven, the language of heaven, but we're getting to understand that through prophecy, right? Through the revealing of Jesus Christ through revelation. I mean, it's a revealing throughout the entire Bible, correct? But prophecy really points to Jesus and it's revealing his character. What was lost in the Garden of Eden after sin? Other than the fact that they sinned, what what was Jesus coming back other than to die and to and to I mean, restore, put it way. restore the character of man? Very, very good. Yeah. So we really, really see what's going on here when it comes to prophecy. Again, I'm just bringing out different points. Someone could teach the class in a much different way. But I really, really think this is a revealing of this is a revealing of talking about a storyline. Uh, 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 we're talking about all the way from the beginning of the Bible to the end of the Bible. And Jesus is just using stories with with uh, uh, Jeremiah, uh, Ezekiel, Isaiah, um, and then uh, we got Daniel and David, all types of Christ, all pointing to Christ, right? So prophecy really is just telling us stories about what's going to happen. And one of the things I like about that he tells us in Amos is that, listen, guys, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen because I love you and I want you to understand and I want you to be ready. So there's two things here, two sides. Jesus is always working for us and always through us. So mm -hmm. he's trying to bring a redemptive side to us. He's trying to redeem us as a people. How many times has God had raised up a prophet and say, listen, I need you to do this. And Isaiah was like, oh, I'm, whoa, I'm a man of unclean lips. But once Isaiah was touched with the cold, he said, who's going to go for me? As Isaiah said, I will. So the God's trying to give us prophecy. Now we're not prophets per se, right? But is it true that the latter rain's coming in the last days and we're going to be a part of the Elijah message and part of the loud cry? And that we are to be giving a last day message, the present day truth, straight testimony. I mean, I really hope we're, as a church, as Venice, are preparing for something great and not just listening to Pastor Jose or can't talk. We're so, all to be Elisha's. If I were to ask you then, I'm sorry, if I were to ask you then, Donald, why is it that not everybody, that the, the, the church is not um, as anxious to understand prophecy as they should? Because what we're saying is that God is telling us about what he's doing. He's revealing his plan to us in secret, which I agree with you. So what is it that is allowing that, that, that why people is not interested in the prophecy as much as they should be? What is I, love your, I love your question. That's a good question because, uh, boy, this is a whole other subject, but we are in a Laodicea state, and I don't want to get on that. It's just a whole other sermon topic. But we really are, um, we really have everything and we're in need of nothing. And why is that even a statement? Is because the day and ages we live in, I mean, we're traveling to and fro. We got information. We got, we can order anything we want and have it within minutes for food. Or we can have it in days from Amazon. And I mean, if, if anything is a, in a day and age where there's very little need of God and everything is self-sufficient, everything is self, um, you can get anything you want, get anything you need. And we're in a land of opportunity where uh, you have everything at your fingertips. And we don't really know what it's like to live in a third world country. And you know what the funny thing is? Even though they're not Adventists, you know, there's more conversions in Africa and Uganda and New Guinea, and they don't have a lot to distract them. They don't have a lot in the world that's causing them not to be close to the Lord. They have nature. They have uh, uh, ways of living in a lifestyle where 
um, swiping stuff on my screen, sorry. Um, where it's just not a lot of distractions in the world. I feel like the, what is the Adventist uh, percentage? It's the smallest in the United States than it is anywhere else in the world. What are we, three to six percent? How sad is that? Why is that? We have so much opportunity here, but yet it's the wrong kind of opportunity. So I think really the United States is an apostasy and we have the biggest wake up call. And one of the funny thing is I could go on and on about, and I won't dare talk about politics and the government side of things, but is the virus fake? Is it real? But is the Lord allowing it to happen for a wake up call for his people? Maybe are we really feeling the deaths of the virus? I don't think so. Are we feeling the effects of the virus of the wake up call? You know, What's going on right now in the world? Well, one reason why I, I mentioned that uh, pose a question to you is because there are so many different theories today about the, the explaining the prophecy that people are really confused, and uh, a lot of times they're you know they would like to follow it, but they can't get a clear picture because there are so many different theories that go on about interpreting prophecy. That's why today we want to uh, just focus uh, on the historicism. Uh, because that is the way that people would fully understand it. We also um, want to take a look at, you know, one of the key principles in understanding prophecy is that because it's symbolic, much of the time element in prophecies are not um, literal time. They are symbolic. And here we come to this idea of the, the year day principle. You might want to give us a few um, thoughts on that, uh, Donald? Sure. So I know you're going a little different route than where I was, and I was rambling a little bit. But um, yeah, so our, our interpretation needs to not be the preterist and not the futurist view. So when I, I'm going to go right to the year day principle in a second, but we really want to understand to do it in the way that Christ teaches, in the way that he gave it to Daniel, the way the angel really, re, that he received it from the angel, right? He, he, he mm -hmm. taught him a way that, so when we take Daniel in relation and you're teaching, you actually start with Daniel 2, and this, everyone's been to biology class, I assume, and we take a skeleton, and what it does is it builds layer upon layer. So we take the skeleton, we take the, the, the blood vessels, we take the tendons, the ligaments, we add on the organs, and then if you keep taking these plastic pieces and you add them, it starts looking like something. It starts being shaped and starts forming into something. So Lord adds upon a layer upon a layer. As we build our and increase our knowledge in the Lord and get to trust Him and know Him, we get to know a little bit more about the prophecy. What does it do? What does it reveal? Where is it going? Who's who's behind the scenes? We all know it's Satan and God, but in the middle, we're caught in the middle, and He's telling us a story, and it builds precept upon precept here, a little there, a little. But it's a as I, as I have wrote down here, Daniel gives an unbroken panorama of history. That unbroken panorama is the historic view. Now, what we don't want to do is we don't want to get wrapped up in and I'm going to explain why I'm saying this. What do the Jehovah's Witnesses think? What do the Catholics think? What do the Presbyterians and the other Seventh-day Baptists believe? What we don't want to do, and like Doug Batchelor says, he goes, listen, if you want to know what truth is, you don't go and study the $100 counterfeit bill. You could study what? Five, six, seven hundred different kind of counterfeits. Is there this kind of ink? There's a strip. Is there a stamp? Is there an emblem? Is there something hidden in there? What you want to do is you want to study the real thing, right? If you're going to be a, a detective and you want to know the counterfeit bill, you take and you find the original plaque, the original print that they print on, and you study it. So when the fake comes, you know what error and truth is or the dividing line. And you get that by knowing and studying the historic view of the Bible, the right interpretation of the Bible, right? Um, so with the day-year theory on Monday, day for year, um, there's a couple texts we can go to. I'm, I'm sure it's in the lesson study. Um, uh, but... If we go to, uh, let, let's say it out loud just for the sake of a class and those who are watching, assuming they don't have a, uh, a study guide, let's go to Numbers 14, 34. And this is a year for a day prophecy. This mm -hmm. falls into the uh, 2300 day prophecy, 2300 year prophecy timeline. Um, and it's important to know because if we don't study it this way, our whole perceptive, uh, our whole pro uh, the way we look at this is going to be distorted. Uh, numbers 14, 34, so I'm going to grab that. And Ezekiel 4, 6. I have 1434. I have okay. 14, here. And someone grab Ezekiel 4 6. Um, it says 1434. For 40 years, one year for each of the 40 days you explored the land, you will suffer for your sins and know what it is like to have me against you. Now, um, we know what that's talking about, right? When they were spying out the land and they were, uh, it's, it's talking about they went out and they were wandering for 40 years. Um, but it's actually, the Lord's telling us about the day year principle right here. So let's read Ezekiel 4, 6. 
Uh, Ezekiel 4, 6 says here, after you have finished this, lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the people of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. Very good. Another day, your principal verse. So why should we choose to believe this? One of the reasons it's easy to believe the historist view is because, like Kent said in the very beginning when he was opening up the statement, he said the Bible can be trusted. Why is that? What has the Bible done in the past that it can be trusted in the future? There's also one more text that uh, in Luke. Um, that yes, 1331. 1331. Yes, good. please read that. Luke 1331 so, to 32. The same day there came a certain of the Pharisees saying unto him, Get thee out and depart hence, for Herod will kill thee. And he said unto them, Go and tell that fox. Behold, I cast out devils, and I do cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I shall be perfected. Uh, nevertheless, I must walk today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet perish out of Jerusalem. Uh, so so um, that text, of course, Jesus, how long did Jesus preach? He, he, he used symbol, he, it was symbolic in that he said days, but actually it follows that he preached, three, he, he, his ministry was three years. Well, if we go back and look at the chart, um, I think it's a, it is written chart. It's a very old. My grandfather has it. The Messiah was cut off in the middle of the week. And that's what we're yeah. talking about here, right? Right on. So what was that full week? What does that represent in time prophecy as far as we know as Adventists? Three and a half years. But what was the full week? It was supposed to be seven years. He was cut off in the middle. He was yeah, cut off correct. in the middle. And so he, his ministry went Yeah, down. so that's three and a half years. That shows the time principle right there, right? That's proof. So he's cut off in three and a half years. So, so this, is a, this is the principle that we use to interpret the scripture, um, Donald, right? Uh, yes. So we, because if you use the literal days, it wouldn't make any sense in the prophecy. So correct. it's important that people but, understand that because if you... If you use, if you just look at the days, the 2,300 days, all this thing, it could, those things could not happen within that period of time. But why should we apply that principle when there's other parts in the Bible in Daniel that talks about Nebuchadnezzar was, uh, what did it say, um, seven literal years for Nebuchadnezzar, right. right? So why don't we apply it there? No, because it was, in Nebuchadnezzar situation, it's a literal. It was literal because it was just speaking directly. Wait, to you just said something that everyone needs to hear. What did you say? It was literal. So the Bible tells us when we should apply it, correct? Yes. And Go ahead. in the case in the case of the the prophecies of Daniel, they're all everything in there is symbolic. The animals are symbolic, you know. So why wouldn't the time be also symbolic? We so, can say the same thing about Revelation, correct? About the woman means the church, mm -hmm. but sometimes. We got to read it in context, right? Yes. I agree. Very good. Um, we, 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 so we really, um, I mean, we also talk about that. And I've got Daniel 20, 9, 24 is a time prophecy. You got Revelation 12, 6, 1260 days. Um, they fled into the wilderness while the church is being persecuted. There's plenty yeah. of text here we can back that up. Um, I mean, but for those who really don't know, uh, what happens when we don't apply the day for a year prophecy? What happens to the time prophecy timeline? It, it, it doesn't fit. Doesn't fit. No, it doesn't, doesn't work. Doesn't, doesn't make doesn't make sense at all. Doesn't make I mean, sense. So why do why do I want to make this very important key point and understand for a very practical sense when we're teaching others, not just for the panel, but when others are listening, they can use this in the workplace, they can use it in their daily lives, they can use it when they're witnessing to people. Why? Why do others, why is it after the dark ages, there were so many different ideas and theories and different views of the Bible? What is it that's going on? Why do people want to have a different view? Why is there a rapture? What in the world is causing all this? Why wouldn't people just keep the Sabbath? Why wouldn't they just keep the timeline? Why wouldn't they just follow the Bible and its predictions? Right. What's going on? What's going now, on behind the scenes? Maybe let somebody answer before, but, but, but uh, just one quick one I would say is that... Um, when you interpret the Bible by the historicist method, it, the little horn and all the things that, that Daniel prophesied points to uh, a church, the Catholic Church, and they didn't want to, that to be the case. The reformers were saying that the Catholic Church were the, were the, the evil church that was destroying the saints, they were the little horn, 
and we're going to get into that later. Uh, so they created philosophies and theories that would counteract the historicist method. So the preterist method and the futurist, futurism method is really designed to counteract the historicist method. And well, I, that's a very good theological point, but let's take that and break it down into a, a sense for maybe some young people or people who are new in the faith. Why, why now that that's done, we figured out, yeah, the Catholic Church behind this, they're doing this, they're causing the, the Constantine change the day from Sabbath. Well, what's the main reason? Why would anybody change anything? What would be the main reason behind why would anybody would change anything? Why is there different views? Why is there different versions of the Bible? Why are they attacking um, truth? Now, I'm not trying to make you guys guess and make this hard, but something's really being attacked here. What is it? If you're going to destroy something, what would you do? Water it down. Uh, give different versions of it. I think what's be really being attacked is one, truth, and two, God's character. Amen. Very God. good. So, yeah, go ahead. Okay. No, so what I, what I really want to bring out, and um, I don't want to make, make it a big guessing game, but I really feel like from the beginning of time, from Eden, Adam and Eve's sin, something was lost, and you said he's here to restore something. But if you take away the Sabbath, what are you doing when you're interrupting that special time? Now I'm getting to this point. It's just using one, one idea. The very thing the Lord says, remember, we might forget. Yeah. Why is it so important that we use that time very wisely? Why is it set aside for us? What does that do when we set aside 24 hours out of our week? And this is going to play into everything else. What's being attacked? Not the Sabbath itself, the word. What's being attacked? What is that made for? Was man, Sabbath made for man? What's going on here? What is the, the whole world was creating a dimension of, we live in a dimension of time, right? We live in a dimension of time. We're judged on how we use our time. If the devil can attack the Sabbath, which he's done, that's long gone away with, we're, we're, we're past dealing with that. We know that the end of the uh, book of Revelation is about worship, right? The third angel's message. Right? So if we destroy scripture, we should destroy the way we interpret it. We're destroying our relationship with Jesus. We don't know how to spend proper time with Jesus. We don't get to know him. And if we don't get to know him, we don't share him properly. And his character is not revealed properly. And God's a tyrant. He's looking up there to, to zap us, to catch us in the wrong. Right? So everything that we think about when the futurists and the, the rapture and we're burning in hell, what's happening? Jesus' character is being attacked in our relationship, and our time is destroyed. And if you don't get to know somebody, if you don't know your wife, what's it like? You can be married for 20 years. You don't sleep in the same bed. You don't, you don't date. You just take care of the kids. You pay the bills. What is that? There's no relationship there. You don't know who your wife is. And what happens? You usually cheat. Now, I'm not saying you're cheating on your wife. I'm saying you cheat on the church. You cheat on God. You cheat with work. You cheat with money. You cheat with going on vacation. You cheat on spending time with him in the morning. Satan here has literally destroyed Bible prophecy by tearing up the timeline, by tearing up the Sabbath, and he's really destroying this relationship that he had in the Garden of Eden that is no longer available. So everyone here is suffering from a very distorted view of Christ, and prophecy is revealing the very thing that Satan's trying to attack. That's pretty much what I have to say for those two days, but I want everybody to understand our time with Jesus is being attacked. We need to spend time with him like Daniel. If Daniel, now mind you this, no one has seen the Babylon. I've seen the ruins on pictures. It's a massive kingdom. If he was in charge of that massive kingdom and he had that entire empire, he was number one. I mean, Nebuchadnezzar made him number one of all the chief Chaldeans and princes and soothsayers, right? If he had time to go open his windows and pray three times a day, can we find time in our business schedules at an eight hour work day with kids to spend time with him three hours a day? I mean, uh, three times a day, 30 minutes in the morning, 30 minutes at night, maybe 15 minutes or 10 minutes at lunch break or work. Do you imagine what church would be like? Do you imagine what our giving away of prophecy would be like? Do you imagine what our interpretation would be like? Can you imagine what life itself would be like? How incredible is that? That's I just wanted great. to tell you guys that. that. That's my interpretation. Yeah. Um, so with that nice overview that you've given us, Donald, we're going to turn it over to Pastor to talk about more detail into the prophecy itself and what it means. Um, yeah. My sections have to do with uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, and it has to do with identifying the little form. Uh, two of the chapters of the Bible that really focused in on that were Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8. Um, what we probably need to understand is that Daniel 
starts very, very broad by giving a large overview of prophecy. Daniel chapter 2, the, the statue. And then in Daniel chapter 7, it focuses in a little bit more. And Daniel chapter 8 focuses in a little bit more. But one thing seems to show up uh, uh, in both chapters, and it is concerning the little horn. Um, could, let's see, got Daniel 7 right here. I'm going to ask if you guys could read just a couple of verses. So if you go to, could go to Daniel chapter 7, I'll just ask for a couple of verses to be read. Um, and I think that will, that will kind of help us along. Daniel 7. I can read for you, but just tell me which ones you want. Yes, yes, yes. That would, it would be great. Um, very good. Verse 8, please. Read verse 8. Daniel 7, verse 8, in the New King James Version says, I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little horn, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up out by the roots, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words. Mm, very good. And can someone read from chapter 7, verses 24 and 25? Okay, 7, 24, 25. The ten horns are ten kings who will come from this kingdom. After them, another king will arise, different from the earlier ones. He will subdue three kings. 25, he will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and the laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, <clears throat> times, and a half a time. Great, great. And could we also read from ver chapter 8, verse 8? Daniel chapter 8, verse 8. Yes, and verse 9, please. Verse 9. So, therefore, the he goat waxed very great, and when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and for it came up, and for it came up four notable ones toward the four winds of heaven. And verse 9 now, and out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceedingly great, Toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. Right. And could someone read for me one last verse, verse 25? Though he is cunning, he so, shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule, and he shall exalt himself in his heart. He shall destroy many in their prosperity. He shall even rise against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without human means. Right. The, uh, realize that this is talking about the same power and it's saying it's talking about the same power because it's also focusing it it came in daniel 7 after the fourth beast which was the beast with iron teeth the scary beast right it came up after that and it came up from that kingdom because it came up among those horns and there and from the lesson it identified a lot of things like number one both are described as horns number two both are persecuting powers number three both are self exalting and blasphemous number four both target god's people five both have aspects of their activities uh, delineated by prophetic time number six both extend until the time of the end number seven both are to be supernaturally destroyed we're seeing a lot of commonalities here and the reality is uh, god has given us those identifying marks of coming from the fourth kingdom for a reason, mm -hmm. for us to be able to identify what that power is, you know? So in order to uh, qualify for this, which many people have misinterpreted what the little horn is, it has to come from that time period. It also has to meet with all those other aspects. And um, history helps us there, the historicist method that was mentioned previous, but not only that, but the church fathers earlier also identified as they were looking at history and, 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 and comparing scripture with scripture, they came up that the only qualifying thing that could be identified as the little horn is the papacy, the papacy, okay? And interestingly enough, even, even in, um, uh, even in uh, Daniel chapter 2, we get a hint, we get a hint uh, of it, like uh, when the iron 
was the uh, Rome, correct? The Roman legs, remember the Roman legs, that time period? Mm -hmm. But then it, all of a sudden we come to the part where uh, iron mixed with clay. So something from that iron age has to have been passed on. And what has been passed on and has been in power since then and still continues in power today? The papacy itself. The papacy itself. Okay. Not only that, but we've got uh, uh, time prophecies of the 1260 days, times, times, and half a times, right? Uh, three and a half months. Uh, it, it, it really, it really, four, I'm sorry, not three and a half months, 42 months. I thank you. I correct myself. <laughs> Uh, 42 months. We have these identifying marks and this repetition, this repetition of details tells us that the subject matter is important. Let's continue on, if we could, to the investigative judgment. And it's interesting to me that uh, in the midst of this, uh, at the end of Daniel chapter 8, it touches on. So it almost seems to be what is the antidote, all right? What is the antidote to this little horn? And God is showing us. It, it, um, let's read it. Let's read it. Let's Before read you it. go on to the, the investigative judgment, can I ask a, a different a, a question on that? Uh, yeah. Go ahead. We, it seemed like this information that you just described uh, is not new. It's not, it, it wasn't brought up by Seventh-day Adventists. It was brought up from by the reformers. Yeah. Before that, so and uh, some people here we talk about it and they say, "Well, this is a Seventh Day Adventist doctrine," but it is not a Seventh Day Adventist doctrine. It has no, been no, no. a doctrine no, that, way before the you know in, by the reformers when they begin to realize that the the church, the Catholic Church, was persecuting the saints and they were doing bad things. They begin to recognize that this they were the little horn. Well, and interestingly enough, I, I'm glad that you bring that up, but what was one of the reasons that actually the pilgrims came over? Religious freedom. Yeah. Persecution. From who? Come on now, from who? From the actual Roman church itself. Right. Right? Why? Because well, they were saying, here, this is the, the way. They were part. protesting against something. Right, the Protestant movement. Protestant you were going to say something, uh, Donald. Here, here's the scary part. People under my age—I don't even know what to call them, uh, millennials or baby—but I don't even know what my generation is. But here's the scary part: no one knows that nowadays. Nobody knows what you're talking about. Nobody knows what the Roman Catholic Church is and the Pro Protestant Reformation and 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 the, the the Mayflower and the people dying and trying to start a new civilization over here and religious freedom and then a, a king and a government. So right. how do we address that? Right, what, right. Those guys don't know what that is. They're not taught right. that. You right. know what the problem is with the Dark Ages? It was so dark and there was no Bibles and there was no truth that they don't really realize that this stuff really happened. And it's not really being taught in history books. Sure. I mean, there's England and fights and France and, you know, the Civil War. But we really don't have a clear picture nowadays of great controversy. Right? Yeah, you, you touched on an important question for me earlier. I didn't get, didn't get a chance to answer. But you touched on the question, why does God speak to us through these prophetic methods? I think it's the very same reason that God speaks to us uh, through parables, mm -hmm. right? There is a, a, a deep truth that God would like us to discover. But there is tremendous value when when you have to dig for it a little bit, when you have to pray about it, right? And we have to ask for the Holy Spirit to help us, to give us understanding. I, I think that when we go after truth like that, then I don't think we, we relinquish it just as quickly as if all of a sudden God just said, here it is. Mm. You see, when all of a sudden you got to work for it, right? You appreciate, I mean, and, 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 and we don't even need, um, uh, uh, the Bible to understand that we appreciate those things that we have to struggle for, right? And 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 we have to grope after God to be able to get that understanding, right? Because it's His Word, it's His Holy yeah. Spirit that will teach us. What does the Lord say? He says, "When you search with Me and you search Me with all your heart, there you go." You find me. It, it's good. funny, like the, the the guys who want to go uh, dig for gold, they go out into the creek and they sift through the dirt and the sand. But no one wants to really go digging deep in the mines and the veins 
Yeah. But it's like the Bible. It's a treasure that when you deep, you dig, you dig, you can scratch the surface and you can be blessed. But if you right. dig and you dig deep, I've heard someone say one time, you really don't understand the gospel of John uh, or Revelation until you read it 50 times and you have a very, very, very small glimpse of who Christ is. Isn't that incredible? But I, I really feel like, uh, I think, Kent, do you remember me saying this last Sabbath in our Zoom meeting? Uh, God's just not going to just give you something. This is a privilege. He's entrusting you with the keys to the kingdom, something that the angels go throughout the universe ministering. He's not going to give you something that you're going to squander when he gave to Samson. What did he do with his talents? How many years did it take him to repent? And God had to do something, I mean, I mean, awful. I mean, God didn't do it himself. He released his, he withdrawed his, his, his protection, right? Like he does with David. David thought he got away with the sin and it found him out. Just like Samson had found him and, and they blinded him and they grinded him. But with us, God is willing to give us the keys to the kingdom. Yeah. I'm going to take it right from your subject. But if you're not willing to just at least say, Lord, I'm willing. Here I am. I don't know a lot, but just give me a little bit. And then I'll trust me with this little light and then give me more light. But if we don't, the Lord's not going to give us any more. So much is given, much is required. Yeah. So we, we, we will agree uh, on both points because that it is true that if you don't search, you won't find. And what does he say? He said, seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be open. It takes some it, God wants to know that we want to do these things, and then he revealed it to us. What do you think, Kemborn? You're missing probably one of the most ask, and it shall be given to you. So right. if you want to have this wisdom. God says all we have to do is ask for the wisdom. He yeah. will provide it to us through the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the investigative judgment. We're only going to cover it just for a minute, uh, for a minute. But I want to talk to you about not necessarily about uh, what is covered in the lesson study for the investigative judgment. I wanna to talk to you about the investigative judgment itself. You see, the investigative judgment is, it is so interesting to get a good grasp. This is why we need to study the Bible as well as prophecy. We need to get a good grasp of what the Bible is talking to us. Everything that is talking about in the Old Testament seems to somehow have intrinsic value to us in understanding the overall picture of God's plan of restoration and salvation. For, for example, okay, there, there is the, the Day of Atonement that the, the children of Israel would celebrate once a year. And through that process, they were cleansing the sanctuary. But right. the reality is, is that uh, uh, Daniel's asking God questions, and 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 um, how does God answer them? He sell, he tells them it will take twenty three hundred evening and morning. He says, Daniel, I already have a plan for this. I have a plan to make everything right. Mm. If you will understand this, you 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 already have knowledge of this. But the reality is. What, uh, how this is taking place, how this is correcting everything, right, is because of something that's going on in heaven on our behalf. Right. I think that we would be humbled if we had a proper understanding of what Jesus is doing for us. You know? I want to touch on that real quick. I have to say something, and this is like exactly what you're saying. What does it mean when it says, and unto 2,300 days, the sanctuary shall be cleansed? I don't want to leave that alone. What is that talking about? What's being cleansed? What in the world would heaven need to do that would have to do a cleansing? Because in the Lord's Prayer, remember what it says? It says, on earth as it is in heaven. So what does that mean? If we just take it and literally think about what's going on here is going on in heaven. But what is, what is going on in heaven? Does the heaven need to be cleansed? Is there sin in heaven? I need, I, I, I'm saying this to, to, to get you to answer me so that people can understand what in the world, because right. how hard is it to understand prophecy for people who just read the Bible? If you don't right. get Bible studies and you don't study the charts and you don't know damn revelation, most people stay clear because it's too hard. Nobody wants to take time to dig deep. They want I'm to scratch sure, the surface and say, I read the Bible. I'm sure so what is that? What's an the answer, and maybe the rest of us might pitch in on that. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. I didn't catch that. No, I'm saying, I'm sure you're going to give give him an answer to that question uh and maybe the rest of us might have something to say to it. 
um, uh, the answer to what question? The one well, it, I want to know. I want to know for the sake of the audience. Who knows if this is going to go to YouTube and might reach a thousand people? We don't want to overlook this. What in the world is being cleansed? What What was the earthly sanctuary have to do with the heavenly sanctuary? And what's happening in 1844? Yeah, yeah. In, in 1844, the 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 uh, cleansing of the sanctuary was a yearly ceremonial ritual uh, service where all of God's people, all of the Israelites, were coming, it, almost like what we would call a camp meeting for us, where everybody came together, and there was a special worship service where the, the uh, priest, uh, the priest was uh, taking part in a, a, um, a sacrificial system to cleanse the sanctuary and to take away everyone's sins, okay, so that the service can continue uh, continue to meet the needs of the people. Mm -hmm. The reality is uh, the, the sanctuary itself was a copy of the original sanctuary. And you get that sense when all of a sudden you find Moses in the Old Testament and him being uh, admonished to, to make sure that the sanctuary, the tent mobile sanctuary that they were building was exactly the same dimensions. Uh, it, it, there's a, a little detail there that you really catch your like. So, so get, copying it is correct. Why? Because it needs to be copied as the original. It's to draw our attention to what is going on in heaven. And why would they have a, a sanctuary in heaven? Well, sin didn't start on earth. Sin actually started in heaven. Right? But it was kicked out. It was kicked out. And well, now we're a lesson book for the world. Yeah. Well, that, that is correct. That is correct. However, the reality is, is that the, the family of heaven was affected by satan's actions not only was it affected by satan's action but others of the family of heaven were affected by that same action we know that because of the a third of the angels were were tossed out of heaven so the reality is is that god is not only rescuing us he's he, he's he's vindicating his character he's rescuing us he's showing all of the angels showing all of humanity he's showing all uh, all people that have been created that he is a loving god and his character should have never come into question. So, yeah. so we he know God's us. on trial. We know God's on trial. He's running a glass, a glass house, a glass government. Right? Well, yeah, yeah. And, and, and the reality is, is that God's trying to make things right. And, and yeah. it, it's interesting that while things on earth are, uh, Satan is taking things in a negative way, God is giving us clear evidence, clear evidence that God is trying to take things the right way. And that's yeah. what I think that the, uh, the cleansing of the sanctuary uh, kind of tells us. And that's why we need to pay attention. This investigative judgment of saying, I'm getting, I'm moving forward. Satan may be doing bad things and we can, we only have to turn on the news and it doesn't matter which news network you listen to. You just have to turn on the news and you get the evidence that things are going bad. And God is saying, you don't understand. I'm still moving forward. I'm yeah. still moving forward with the plan of salvation towards rectifying what has been wrong. And right. the investigative judgment is getting, getting that ready. Why? It's reviewing everyone's case. I it's love reviewing, that. It's reviewing your I case. It's reviewing my case. It's getting us ready. Yes, Ken Ford. I love that description uh, because it draws our attention to the fact that the sanctuary itself here is an illustration of the plan of salvation. Correct. Correct. And the plan of salvation goes from the cross, uh, into the heavenly sanctuary. Correct, correct. So when we look at um, um, 1944, we're seeing the transition where Jesus is moving from one uh, place in the temple to the next one. He's moving from the holy place to the holy of holies. And it is that representation that, uh, Pastor, you mentioned when you say the people get together to have this ceremony called atonement. They do this once a year. And of course, that illustrates the fact that God is ready now to move sin out from from in, in a judgment. So it becomes a judgment uh, time when they do the once a year. It was a kind of a judgment uh, because those who didn't participate would be thrown out of the, the the Israel. So here we see the prophecy of Daniel points to that, both in chapter seven and of course chapter eight, that. Uh, we're going to get to this point where the, the 2,300 uh, days or years 
completed in 1844, and Jesus moved from one apartment in the center to the next. Correct, correct. Chris, so let, me, please let me say one last thing. I just wanted to make a very practical point for people who are listening, because it might sound very clear to us, but a lot of people just still have a hard time. So I want to break this down and, and make this very easy and fun for people. Day of at one meant. We are to be at one with Christ, right? Everyone on his own. And what Ken is saying is there is no more earthly sanctuary in the sense of Moses' temple and the, the tent moving around, right? And, and the temple of King Solomon. But we're talking about the sanctuary is now in here. You guys can see, right? The sanctuary, the temple of God now dwells in our heart. So the cleansing of the sanctuary is our hearts and minds being prepared to be ready for the second coming of Christ. No one's entering heaven with sin, correct? So the cleansing, what Jesus is doing up in heaven, and the investigative judgment, we are getting ready. The Lord is working through us as an intercessor. The cleansing of our hearts and minds. People becoming at one with Jesus. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Very good. Okay. Chris, I, I'm getting, getting all kinds of uh, messages and phone calls. <laughs> the way the devil works. Hold on, I got my baby crying. I'm still here. He's, I got to get him. He's sleeping. Um, go ahead, Pastor. Uh, yes, uh, Chris. Sure, forward. yeah, and just kind of uh, jumping into Thursday with typology as prophecy. And really, we've been talking about typology, uh, you know, in several different capacities uh, during this panel discussion. Like, we just got done describing and talking about the earthly sanctuary, which is just a good illustration of typology uh, as prophecy. And of course, there's no, I think there's no better illustration of typology than the lamb. And then we know throughout the scripture, uh, when the lamb is talked about, uh, it's talked about in, in the context of Jesus. Uh, and, and also, I really enjoy uh, Derek Morris's um, Hope Sabbath School. And Derek uh, talks about a Bible uh, professor that he had, um, I think, in academy or maybe even college where uh, he talked about, you know, if you don't necessarily know the answer to the question about prophecy, just say Jesus. And I'm like, amen to that. It just, everything just points to Jesus, whether it be like, say, the table of showbread, um, whether it be the lamb, the rock, um, the bronze serpent, uh, it just consistently points uh, to Jesus as our savior, uh, who's our redeemer, who's our creator. Uh, and so really just kind of wrapping up typology is just kind of that physical, tangible uh, actuality elements of either uh, like a person or an event or it can be an institution or a thing, like we've talked about uh, with, say, uh, a lamb or the bronze serpent or the earthly sanctuary. And if, um, say, Pastor Josue, if you can maybe read uh, another one of my favorites about the rock, where it's talked about in different points of scripture. If you can read Exodus uh, chapter 17 and then verses 5 to 6, and then we can talk about the typology there as it refers to the rock. Yeah, let me, let me pull that up. I almost have it up. 17, 5 and 6, it says this. The Lord answered Moses, go out in front of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff which, with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock of Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. Yeah, it's kind of interesting too, as we're kind of reminded of the contrast here, we're later uh, in Moses's um, uh, leadership, uh, he's asked to speak to the rock and he disobeys uh, the Lord's commandment and he actually strikes it later on. Uh, but here he's actually uh, uh, instructed to actually strike the rock. And maybe just throwing this out as the obvious obvious question is, who does the rock here represent? Jesus Christ is the rock. Yeah. Amen. The yeah. And we also know, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> no, the, Jesus Christ is the rock, the foundation. You build your house upon the rock. That's right. He's a foundation for all truth. Yeah. Another great typology there is the foundation. Absolutely. Yeah. Ken Bourne, uh, also in scripture, refers to the rock. If you can read 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Uh, in verse 4. Okay. It also refers to the rock. While he's pulling that up, uh, what I wanted to, to share was, 
I like that the rock actually provides water. Oh, amen. Like yeah, amen like, to that. The water okay. of life, right? Yeah, because it, it's it's providing what the people needed. So, go ahead with uh, with the verse, Sam. Um. So that's that's um, First Corinthians ten and verse four. Verse four. And did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Amen. Amen. And thanks for reading that. Some more typology uh, illustrations there. And you can, and it's really endless. This is once again, it really helps kind of uh, for anyone reading the Bible and understanding prophecy uh, for sure. Uh, is to have some of those tangible kind of applications, uh, like we talked about earlier, parables, uh, whether it be history. But in this case, the typology helps us make, I think, more of a theoretical kind of connection uh, to the practical, tangible aspects. And so uh, the, the typology as prophecy is also very important for us to understanding, understanding prophecy. And, and then once again, understanding how it points to Jesus in so many capacities as a creator, uh, as, as our... Um, our, as our savior and, our, and as our redeemer. And so with that, I know we're running out of time. I guess I'll turn things back over to, to Ken for to wrap things up. Hey, Ken, before we do that, I want to take typology and not miss the, the great points of my type of typology. If I were to just be someone looking in on this conversation will be types of Christ. And the, yes, the rock, the water, where there's water, there is life. But I want types of ology for, I look to David as a typology. I look to Solomon as a typology. I look to Joseph. He, he read, I mean, he yeah. fled, right? And his, 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 his coat or his garment was there and Potiphar, you know, she, she complained, but he ran. Da Daniel purposed in his heart, a type of Christ. We looked at these the stories and we see rocks and pillars of people that are leaning on Jesus and not their own understanding. In all their ways, they're acknowledging Christ and he directs their past. But that's because they have these stories. They have these ways of interpreting the Bible that are very clear. They're very led by the Holy Spirit. And that's because they spend time with Jesus. And when Satan comes knocking at their door, they know exactly what to do. And they know what sin looks like. Right. Job was a job. Jo uh, Job was a, a, an upright and just man and shunned evil. We all need to be the same. Amen. Amen. In the interest of time, we have to wrap up pretty quickly. Um, we realize that the Bible continued to be a book that is uh, unique from other books. Today, it still remains unique. And as we read it, we should read it feeling, as my grandma used to say, that God is speaking to you personally. And you don't have to wait to get a, a vision or something extraordinary. But when you read the Bible, it is God's conversation with you. And in terms of prophecy, it, was, it, it, it certainly is important uh, to, the, in, to us because if 30% of the Bible is about prophecy, then it means that God wants us to know about prophecy. Amen. And it's interesting that uh, there are different types of prophecy, of course, but if we realize that as, as uh, both Donald and, and uh, Pastor and, and uh, Chris have said, that in the type, it's, it's, it's always a typology because everything points to Jesus. So when we're reading prophecy, just remember that it is pointing to Jesus' return. And as we said earlier, if we just look at prophecy in two ways, one way dealing with the, Messi the, the, the Messianic prophecy, dealing with Jesus' first appearance, and the ap 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 say it for me. apostolic. Ap 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 <laughs> that, that, that thing, that prophecy that deals with end time prophecy, which uh, deals with Jesus' second coming. So in that case, we, you know, one of, one of, those are the two easy ways that we could just look at uh, the prophecy, prophecy in the Bible, and focus on that. We see the first, uh, the one that points to the first one, and then looking at the type of prophecy point to the second one. And in the sanctuary itself, the building itself, it explains both. So with that, uh, we will continue to talk about interpretation of the of scriptures in the next week lesson. Uh, but at this time, we're going to conclude, and uh, we're going to just ask uh, Chris to pray for us. In our heads, dear Father in heaven, Lord, thank you so much for your love and for your, your many blessings, Lord. 
And thank you for the invitation we have to work in your vineyard, Lord, and spreading your word, spreading the gospel, the good news message to those we meet each and every day. We ask that you continue to pour out the Holy Spirit that may embolden us here in these last days, that we may go out as the apostles did on the day of Pentecost, spreading the word and baptizing thousands uh, in one day, Lord. We ask for that continued guidance, strength, wisdom, and knowledge as we move through these last days. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That's a privilege, Kent. We said it.